Okay guys, you've been asking for this one for a long time. So on this episode of Everything You Need to Know, we're talking about how to buy your first sailboat. I reached out to a lot of sailing friends and the Lady K community for help on this episode because there's more than one way to buy your first sailboat. And there's a pretty good discussion going on the Lady K Facebook page. So I'll put a link to that down in the description if you wanna check it out and, and participate in that discussion. I'm sure there's lots to learn and there's a lot of opinions and a lot of thoughts there. I'm also gonna give a shout out to every one of my sailor friends that helped me with this episode with their thoughts on how to buy your first sailboat. And a few of them have YouTube channels, so I will put the links to those YouTube channels in the description. So there's a lot of ways to get into sailing and I think every sailor will tell you the same thing. You should go and crew with someone else first particularly crewing in a race if you can, because you learn more in racing. An hour of racing is equal to 10 hours of just, you know, bombing around the bay on a sailboat, having a booze cruise. Racing teaches you a lot and it teaches you what you might want to get in a boat. Let's assume that you already know that you want to go sailing. You've already done the crewing and you figured out that you want a boat. Um, and this is my opinion on how to do it. And I've obviously done it. I bought my own first boat and I sort of graduated from there to bigger and bigger and bigger boats. I've also gotten countless friends into sailing. I have some really good stories of friends who came out on Lady K once and within a month bought their own sailboat, their own first boat. So I have some experience with this. Lady K and everything you need to know are of course brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to keep this channel improving. So a big shout out this week to the newest patrons that join the team, um, Gearman and Albert. Welcome. So buying your first sailboat can be a daunting task because there's so many different types of sailboats for so many different purposes out there. The very first question you need to ask is this, what are you going to use it for and where? So are you ocean cruising, island hopping? Are you in the Great Lakes? Um, do you plan to sleep on it? Do you plan to cook on it? Or does it need to cross an ocean? For the sake of this episode, the perspective we're gonna take is for the first boat, for someone who thinks they wanna get into sailing, has crewed a few times, knows a little bit about sailing, really enjoys it, but just doesn't know where to start on actually owning their own sailboat. And we're primarily going to be looking at sort of lake sailing people, not ocean crossing or anything like that. Sailing in protected waters, if you will, which I think pretty much covers most of us. One of the first things you need to decide is, do you want a sailing dinghy or do you want a sailboat? And that's two very different things. A lot of us got our starts in sailing dinghies, particularly the laser, a, a sloop rigged sailing dinghy, because you learn so much in a sailing dinghy. And if you have a calm enough lake with a pretty good predominant wind, you can actually learn a tremendous amount having a sailing dinghy and you can pack it up on a trailer and bring it home at the end of the day. And there's no extra cost involved in having one. So if you want to do the sailing dinghy thing, I think a laser or a sunfish, anything like that, something cheap and easy, just do that. But we're going to skip over sailing dinghies. Um, one of the big suggestions was get your start in sailing dinghies. And that is a wonderful suggestion and you definitely should. Um, but we're not going to do sailing dinghies in this episode. We're going to skip over that. We're going to talk about your own actual real full-size sailboat. One of the other big questions is when you're buying a sailboat, does it need to be trailerable? Because if you're going to be dragging it home and trailering it every time you want to use it, that narrows down the perspective boats very, very quickly. Only certain amount of boats are trailerable and we're looking at like McGregor's and O'Day's and things like that. Um, you're gonna narrow down the field very quick if you need it to be trailerable. So make that decision ahead of time. Now into sort of the meat of it, a lot of people when they buy their first sailboat, it's a boat of opportunity. Somebody nearby is selling it, it's cheap, it's in reasonably good condition, so they buy it. I'm gonna take a more logical approach. We're gonna step back a few steps here and we're just gonna pretend that you're willing to drive far away to get whatever it is that you want. So it opens up the field quite a bit more. And the number one question I'm going to ask you is what keel type do you want before you even talk about brands or accommodations or does it have a galley, anything like that? What keel type do you want? And that's, that's got to be number one on your list is, are you going to be in very, very shallow waters most of the time? Is your, is your home turf very shallow? In which case you're going to want a shoal draft or a swing keel or something like that. Are you buying it because you want to go racing? 
in which case you want a fin keel, something quick, something that points up wind really well, but isn't very shallow. You're going to need, you know, at least an eight foot area of water, eight feet deep all the time so that you can have a good six foot fin keel. Where are you going to be taking this boat? Are you just going to be stomping around your, your local area? Um, and are you actually going to be going out in big waters? Do you live on the coast? Are you going in the ocean? If you're going in the ocean, we're talking about probably a full keel boat for your first boat. And there's a lot of 20 something foot boats with full keels. You can do that. It's totally fine. But if you're a Great Lakes sailor or you're sailing on some inland lakes or protected waters, really a full keel boat might not make all that much sense. You're not going to be out getting your butt kicked in storms and things like that. So I think full keel boats have their place if you're going to be coastal cruising on your first boat which is ballsy, I'll give you. Um, but full keel is gonna take really good care of you, especially not knowing everything you need to know to sort of be out there in the ocean, get a full keel boat. It'll protect you, it'll keep you safe. But if you're inland, protected waters, you're really between a fin or a shoal draft or sort of a shoal draft with a swing keel. Um, if you're gonna be in really shallow water, you're gonna want the shoal draft. If you're gonna be shallow water and wanna go fast, you want the shoal draft with the swing keel so that you can drop it down when you're in the deeper water and point up wind much better. If depth doesn't matter, then just get, you know, a five foot, a five and a half foot fin keel CNC or something. You really can't go wrong with that. My boat, Lady K, happens to have a modified fin. So it's not a shoal draft, but it's not a full, you know, six foot fin. She draws about five and a quarter feet. Um, with that modified fin and it's a little bit longer than a normal fin so it's a little bit more toward the full keel sort of the best of all worlds and the worst of all worlds okay so you figured out which keel types you can live with and that sort of narrows the brands down the rudder maybe you don't care maybe you do but that narrows it down further further the next thing is what sort of engine do you want in your first boat I'm gonna say probably an outboard because the first boat's going to be relatively small, 20-something feet. An outboard is what these boats have. It's just going to make more sense. Outboards are much more simple. They're easy. And if something goes catastrophically wrong, you can undo it, take it off, throw it out, and put a different one on. It is so easy, especially for somebody that's just getting into sailing and might not know that much about boats or engines. The outboard makes sense. And then you have the two-stroke outboard and the four-stroke outboard. The two-strokes are just legendary. They run forever as long as you do a carb kit and spark plugs and gear oil, the thing will just run forever. It, it really will. There's outboards out there right now, cruising even, going to the Bahamas that are from the 60s or 70s. These things are fantastic, the two-stroke ones. The four-stroke stuff that's out now, it's much better on fuel. It's much more quiet. It's better for the environment. A little more temperamental, a little more high maintenance, but um, you kind of got to make that decision. If you want something that's just going to start every single time, that four-stroke, and I have a four-stroke on the dinghy, a Merc 99, it starts first pull every time, all the time. Fantastic engine, and it sips fuel. It'll, it'll run for months on a tank of fuel with the amount that I actually use the dinghy, so that's fantastic. When you look at your boat, if it's not going to be an outboard boat, it's going to be an inboard boat. The problem with inboards is they're more expensive. They're more expensive to maintain, they're more complicated. They generally have an alternator though, so they're gonna be charging your battery. And they're better for the really long-term stuff. If you're gonna put 2,000, 3,000 nautical miles on this boat every year, you're probably looking at an inboard. If you're just bombing around the bay on the weekend, having a good time with your friends, the outboard is fine. And then we come, when we talk about inboards, we come to gas or diesel. Um, the Atomic 4 is the legendary, almost every boat had one gasoline engine inboard that was in a lot of sailboats. And a lot of people swear by the Atomic 4. Um, and I've worked on a lot of Atomic 4s. There's nothing really wrong with them. They will run all day long. But if I'm going to go two, 3,000 nautical miles a year, I'm getting the diesel. I'm, I'm just doing it. They're more efficient. Um, they're easier to take care of and they're newer, a newer Yanmar 3G. Uh, they're just fantastic engines. I, I, if I'm gonna do a lot of miles, I'm looking at an inboard diesel. If I'm bombing around the lake on the weekend, you know, a Yamaha 99 outboard, no problem. The next thing we wanna talk about is sail plan. So you see like Catalina tall rigs and CNC tall rigs. Um, you see catches and yawls and you see cutters and, and all this kind of stuff. I think your first boat needs to be as simple as it can possibly be and just a normal mast head sloop rig is perfect. The forestay goes all the way to the top of the mast. 
there's just, you know, everything's really easy. It's comparable to any other boat. Getting support and expertise for just a regular sloop is going to be the best thing for you to learn on and the best thing for you to handle. Um, I would stay away from tall rigs and I would stay away from things with more than one set of spreaders. Um, I want a mast that I can drop myself. I want the rig to just be simple, simple, simple. Um, I want a main with two reef points because as a new person, and this is important, as a new sailor, you are going to go out at dumb times when you shouldn't have gone out, or you're going to go out and just not be confident enough. And the ability to put two reefs in the main is incredible. It, it makes sailing so much more safe. Um, maybe I can take Lady K out with no reefs in it and 25 knots, and, and I'm fine with it, but I have the experience. If you were to take Lady K out as a new sailor, I would say you're in charge, put two reefs in it. You're going to be slower, but it's going to be safer, and you're going to be able to handle it better. So make sure you have at least two reef points in the main. The other thing is a roller furler. Um, this is a big deal. My second boat was a, a CNC Redline 25. It did not have a roller furler. It had a Hank on jib. And I took it out alone in the Great Lakes. And in the Great Lakes, when a storm is coming, you may not have any notice. And by the time you see it, you're too late. I was, I don't know, probably eight miles from my home port, eight miles from safety. And I saw the storm coming. And within about half an hour, it was on me. I came into the harbor and they were out there watching me come in because I didn't have a roller furling. I couldn't get the jib down. And I had tried to run up on deck and wrestle it down. And every time I did, you know, the tiller line that held the tiller would let go and the boat would spin around. And it was just an absolute nightmare. And, um, you know, I could have been killed. It was a scary situation. I came in surfing waves at over 10 knots um, in this 25 foot boat with half the jib in the water and the jib was just shredded. Um, it was a terrible experience. And the, the moral of that story is get a furling. If you can buy your first boat with a roller furling, do that because had I been able to just pull a line and furl that sail up from the cockpit while I, while I was steering, it would have changed everything about that day for me. It would have changed everything about sailing for me, having a furling. And the weird thing is actually when I got back to port, I immediately set out on the internet trying to figure out how to make my own roller furling because they are very expensive and I didn't specifically buy a boat with one. So I didn't have the three grand to spend on one and then you got the sail modified and all this stuff. So I made one out of PVC and I cut notches in it everywhere there was a hank and I put it over the forest day. I built a drum in the plumbing aisle at Home Depot um, and everywhere there was a notch, I clipped the, the jib on and then when you pulled it, it would actually roll the PVC up and it rolled the jib up. So I made my own roller furling and you know what? It probably saved my life a few times. So absolutely a reefable main, absolutely a roller furling if you don't know what you're doing. If you can't get a roller furling, then I would say make sure you take the jib down or reduce to a smaller jib probably 45 minutes before you think you need to. As soon as, and every sailor says this, as soon as you think you need to reef, you're already too late. And that is absolutely true. Absolutely very, very important. So you can get a furling, then when you do make mistakes and you don't reduce sail quick enough, you have a furling. You can actually take care of it very quickly and very easily. Turn up wind, get the jib luffing, pull the furling line, put away half the jib, leave a little sliver out, sail it back in. You're very safe. Everything's good. Next up is how much should you spend? I was asked actually today, you know, I have a you know, $50,000 budget on my first sailboat. No, no, don't spend that much money. I would say your first sailboat, and this is again my opinion, don't spend more than five grand. Right now it's just a hobby for you and you think you want to get involved in it. And with any hobby, you might do it for a year and just not want to do it anymore. And sailboats might hold their value, but they probably won't. So less than five grand, I would be in the $2,500 area. Um, and understand that there's more than just the cost of the boat. You also have to put in a repair budget because no matter how well you look over this boat before you buy it, it's going to need stuff and you're going to need a couple thousand dollars to deal with that problem. The other thing is, where are you gonna keep the boat? You're gonna to have to pay to put the boat in a slip in the summer. I, you're gonna need money for that. So two grand, 2,500, I paid a thousand dollars for my first sailboat and I'm very happy that I did. Next up, keep it simple. No matter what boat you buy, and this is just proven over and over and over again, I made this mistake, everyone I know has made this mistake. No matter what you buy, you'll immediately want to start dumping money into it to customize it and add things and, you know, radios and just whatever it is that you like about boats, you're going to put in there and you're going to spend all this money. Don't. 
spend money on a few things. A solid VHF radio, that's number one. Um, just to make sure that if you need help, you can get help. Some source of music was important to me. A couple USB ports to charge the phones. Um, and a good deep cycle battery to make sure everything stays working. And make sure all your lights work. Navigation lights, mastheads, steaming, they need to work. If you end up liking sailing, um, and there's a good chance you will, then you're going to upgrade to something bigger a year later. So if you dump a bunch of money into rewiring the boat and adding all kinds of crazy stuff and putting a TV in there and a, a, you know, a good head and all this kind of stuff, you're going to end up selling it anyway and you will never get the money you put into it out of it when you sell it. You pay $2,500 for the boat, you put two grand into like all this cool stuff and rewire it and do all this crazy stuff and you get $2,500 for the boat when you sell it. It's just not worth it. So get, get a boat, plan on keeping it for a year, make the bare minimum requirements to be safe and then sell it after a year. And you know what? If you want to keep it for the rest of your life, fine. But give it that 12-month period or that one season before you start dumping money into unnecessary things. Another big deal, and we talked about this in Sailplane, is get something that's easy to handle. You want all the lines led aft if they can be. I stress very, very strongly with my jib in the water surfing back in during the storm thing. If you have furl or hank on sails and you don't have a furling for the jib, put a downhaul on the jib. That's just a line that clips on the top of the jib, then the jib goes up. That line goes up with it, it comes down to a block and it comes back to the cockpit. If you throw the halyard off and pull that line, it's gonna pull the jib down in a heck of a hurry. You want the boat to be set up so that you can single hand it and so that when you do get in over your head and you will get in over your head, you can solve the problem very, very quickly. Douse the sail, start the outboard, get into safety. That's learning to sail, knowing when to run, and making sure the boat is set up to run. And then also making sure the boat is set up just to be safe and easy. You want good lifelines, solid stanchions. Make sure you're not going overboard. Make sure the boat is just absolutely perfectly set up so that when the worst happens, you'll be okay. Okay, so let's say you, you've taken all this advice or whatever advice you want to take, and now you're looking at boats, and you've figured out you want you know, A, B, or C brand in this particular size range. I'm gonna say you need to be looking in the 22 to 25 foot range as your first boat. That's my opinion. That's where a lot of us start. Um, what you wanna check are, um, well, what are the first two rules? Number one rule, keep the water out of the boat. So you wanna check through hulls. You wanna check any protrusion under the water line that could possibly take on water or possibly break. That's number one. Number two is keep the people in the boat. So you want to check everything on the boat for safety. Make sure you have everything you need to make sure everybody on board is safe. Then you're looking at the rig with sailboats, the standing rigging, the mast, the cables that hold the mast up. How old are they? Do they have corrosion? Actually look into the swage fittings at the end and make sure they're not rusting out through the bottom. If they are, probably walk away from a $2,000 boat, walk away. Because putting new standing rigging on a boat is at least five grand. I wouldn't go near it. So standing rigging, Running rigging are the lines, the ropes that make the sails work and everything. Running rigging is sort of a big deal because it can get very expensive. It, it can be a couple bucks a foot for these lines. Um, it wouldn't be the end of the world if it needed all new running rigging, but it is a big expense. You might spend a thousand dollars on running rigging, so look at that. And then a huge thing my friend Andrea was talking about, and actually I think Wes was talking about, um, and Mark was talking about, is these boats are going to be balsa core um, decks. Um, the coach top and the deck, the whole top side of the boat, and sometimes the hull of the boat are going to be balsa core, or they're going to be some sort of core. If the deck is rotted, you need to know about it before you make an offer on this boat, because repairing rotted core is extraordinarily expensive and complicated and messy, and you just don't want to deal with it. If you're about to spend five grand, spend it somewhere else if the boat needs core work. So what you want to do is you want to walk around on the deck, look for soft spots under your feet. If you can get a sounding hammer, which is a small hammer with a plastic head, and just tap the boat as if you're tapping drywall looking for a stud. You're looking for a different sound. So good core will be a like tap, tap, tap sound. If the core is already rotted, you're going to get a thud, thud, thud sound. It's not going to be sharp. It's going to be very dull and very thud. Um, a couple of soft spots in the deck on a... $2,500, $3,000 boat, small soft spots, I'd probably be okay with it. Um, but if there's big portions of the deck that are soft, just walk away. 
The other thing you want to look at on these boats is what do they come with? What's, what sort of anchor does the boat come with? How much road does it come with? Is the anchor and road suitable for the weight of the boat? Is it suitable for where you're going to be sailing it? If you want to overnight on this thing, which you probably will, you can overnight on a 22-foot boat, no problem. Do you have enough road for your sailing ground? Because chain is expensive and three-quarter inch nylon is expensive. So what does it come with? Does it come with any electronics? Is there a VHF included? You could spend two, three hundred dollars on a reasonable VHF setup. So does it have one? Does it work? How old is it? Does it actually get all the channels? A lot of older VHFs skip a whole bunch of the higher channels. So wherever you're sailing might use channel 72, for example, for you know local communications that are non-emergency. Does it get 72? A lot of them don't. The last one I got is uh, don't listen to naysayers. And this is actually, I thought about it when I think it was Ben that said it. Um, I thought about it for a minute and I was like, you know what? He's absolutely right. The sailing world is full of very, very opinionated people. Um, I, I would imagine a lot of them have never left the dock. And that's just my opinion. Do your own research. I mean, it's easy to go online and go to Cruisers Forum or go to Google and, and type in, you know, what kind of boat should I buy for my first boat? And you're going to get a billion opinions. It's like, what kind of oil do I use? It's going to be an end, endless argument. Don't do that. Do your own research. Become at least a little bit educated on all the things involved in owning your first small sailboat so that you know every single little piece of that puzzle at least somewhat. And then you can make an educated decision and don't listen to naysayers. There's a lot of people out there that say, no, you've got to spend 50 grand on your first boat or you know, you have to buy this brand or that brand and don't do this and do do that. And, and they just so many opinions. Do your own research. You, you cannot go wrong by knowing everything that you need to know so that you don't have to go through this whole, the soup on the internet of opinions and just garbage and crap. Don't post anything. Don't listen to anybody. Do the research and learn the stuff. Learn it. So where do we stand? Uh, you can go sailing dinghies, which is fantastic, spending a year in sailing dinghies, or you can go into like a small sailboat just to you know stretch your feet out and make sure you want to get involved in this hobby because this is an expensive hobby if you're going to go down this road. Um, so my personal opinion is I think you should be in a 22 to 25 foot sailboat and there's a few brands that I strongly support because I've sailed on them or owned them. A few makes and models that I support in that regard. Um, there's tons of other options out there and these might not be available where you're from but around here there's actually a pretty good story. Um, I'm going to start with a Chrysler 22 which yes Chrysler made sailboats. Well they didn't make sailboats. They bought a company that made sailboats um, a long time ago. The Chrysler 22, I think there's three of them within 150 miles of where I live. All three of them have cycled through the Yacht Club I'm a member of more than once. So if you go to any member of the Yacht Club that I'm a member of, um, four or five of them have owned the same Chrysler 22 as their first boat. So we all know where all three of these boats are and they keep changing hands for $1,000 every time. $1,000, $1,000. Come with a cradle or a trailer, $1,000. These boats have traded hands so many times and it's always everyone's first boat. I would bet you 60% of this club, their first boat was one of these three Chrysler 22s. It's incredible because now you have the history of the boat. You know everything about it. And if you need help on your first sale, one of us used to own it. So that's fantastic. I love the Chrysler 22 for that um, because that's what's local here. There's lots of them. The other one is a Catalina 22, which is very, very similar. And then a Cal 25. I love the Cal 25 because it's a one design race boat. My friend Jay had one. It's still kicking around somewhere around here. Um, it is incredibly fast. Jay was winning races on it. Um, great boat. And that was Jay being new to sailing. So that's fantastic. So you're looking at 22 to 25 footer, Catalina, C&C, uh, that kind of stuff. Wonderful boats. Um, anyway, I want to give a big shout out to everybody on Lady K Facebook page that helped out with ideas and things like that. I want to give a big shout out to Mark from Sailing Vagari. Um, link in the description. I want to give a big shout out to Wes, who has his YouTube channel. I'm going to put a link down there. It's a salty sailor. Um, and Dwayne and Ben and Andrea and everybody who was on Facebook just throwing ideas at me. I love you guys. That's it for this week. Hopefully I answered some of your first boat buying questions. If you want to see an episode on a given subject, throw it down in the comments. I will see you guys. Stay safe.